Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back to um, a live section of the day and welcome, Ian. Thank you for that fantastic uh, presentation. Really useful. Um, we've got an absolute stack of questions to get through in less than 15 minutes. So I'm going to fire in, if I may. Um, yeah. Let's get cracking. So firstly, there's two questions together. Um, what, the first one is, do you have any tips for someone who is concerned about a client's mental health but struggling to find a way to open a conversation up with them about it? And attached to that, what would I do if a client was in immediate danger or crisis? Okay, uh, well, firstly, thank you for the questions. Uh, it's, it's really encouraging to know there are so many. Uh, I'll take the second one first, if I may. If someone's in crisis, it's obviously a, a terrifying and very worrying situation for everybody involved. Uh, if you believe that somebody is having a mental health crisis of some sort, particularly if you think that they are at a point where they cannot keep themselves safe and they may res represent a risk to themselves for, for whatever reason, the course of action should uh, almost always be uh, phone 999. You know, call an ambulance, get that person safe. The, the, the priority in that moment has to be safety. And sometimes safety takes a priority over kind of more kind of nuanced or kind of subtle approaches. But if it is your belief in that moment, this person may, in the worst case scenario, kind of attempt to take their own life or or mm -hmm. something equally catastrophic or severe, the, the priority is, is to make sure that they're safe. And I think calling an ambulance under those circumstances, make sure they can get to a hospital, make sure they can be assessed by a mental health professional there who can come up with a plan to ensure their kind of safety going forward. So I think that, that's always what I have in my mind. And sometimes that may seem like a kind of unsophisticated response, but it's, it's often or kind of always ultimately what you end up thinking about doing, get the person to hospital, if you can take them in your car, if you can't, or you have any kind of concerns about that for whatever reason, being a professional, call 999. In terms of the first question, you know, how to open up this conversation about you know, mental health and well-being with somebody you're supporting when it seems like a, a difficult or challenging topic to, to, to open up with. There are a number of ways in, I suppose I would suggest. I mean, asking them directly, you know, th there is a stereotype of, of British people as being kind of unwilling or sometimes unable to discuss these subjects, so maybe it'd be a difficult one to open up directly. But it's possible to notice some stuff, like to say, you know, I notice at the moment, you know, you've, you've mentioned how tired you are. Do you think that could be as a consequence of all the stress you've been going through? Or, you know, you, you, you said you're feeling tearful the other day. It seems like actually feeling a bit upset at the moment. Try and kind of identify things that they've perhaps said to you. Notice the things that they've mentioned which have given you a clue that they might be struggling around, you know, their emotional well-being. Maybe it's something related to that, like sleep, like, like appetite, like uh, relationships with other people. Like withdrawing socially, you know, a number of people really want to spend time with you. They notice that they've not seen you recently. So sort of wondering what's going on. Is it is it to do with just how difficult things are at the moment? And you know, often making some attempt to to, to normalise that. You know, many people under these circumstances, be it the pandemic, be it a new diagnosis, be it something else, would be feeling really difficult. I'm kind of wondering if that's what you're feeling too. So, so try directly if that's not proving to be kind of profitable then make it to do with something that you've you've noticed yourself and yeah. identify that with them and then perhaps try and kind of build upon that. Great. Thank you. That's some really great advice. Uh, I've got a question come in about children. Uh, we see and hear of an increasing number of children and young people with visual impairment um, experiencing mental health issues, often very serious. Um, CAM support is rarely specific enough what can we do to support these children in a much more specific way? Yeah, it's a really good question. That kind of lies at pretty much exactly the heart of what I do. So as I mentioned in the video, you know, I work in a hospital to try and provide a similar function to CAMS, although I guess more specifically to do with some of the, the symptoms associated with the diagnosis. But an acknowledgement of the fact that there are the kind of specific issues that perhaps things like child and adolescent mental health services are not adequately sensitive to kind of pick up on. There are now kind of five or six of us working for Fight Against Blindness, uh, the charity that funds us in hospitals throughout the UK. But that is, of course, kind of kind of small beans compared to the number of children living with significant visual impairment. One of the main themes that came through my head while kind of writing that, that presentation and then discussing it is, is the idea that 
the professionals that have attended today's conference and, and VI professionals more generally have a really critically important role in unpacking some of the th issues that may be quite obvious to us, but will be entirely alien to professionals like those in CAMS around issues specific to somebody living with, with a VI and children no different to anybody else. So where, where special support is unavailable, of course there are, um, uh, you know, uh, QTVIs and stuff that can help trying to also work at nuancing these, these kind of conversations. But with professionals uh, attending today and professionals working VI more broadly can try and explain when making referrals for mental health support or when providing additional information for a child that you know is accessing special mental health support about the specific issues that maybe CAMS are being insufficiently sensitive to. And there are always opportunities like annual review meetings at schools, education healthcare planning uh, meetings or, or the paper associated with those to try and start including more information about things they may not be picking up on. And in the slide, I, I put in information about how the um, lockdown lifting and one-way systems in schools had disproportionately disadvantaged visually impaired children. It wasn't something that was difficult to anticipate if you work in this field, but schools in the majority had no idea this was going to be a problem. And again, I, I think that's a really, really good example and a very live one of a little input from the type of professionals attending today. R and I B have this kind of letter or some letters they produced specifically for this purpose can massively kind of smooth those challenges when they arise. So, in knowing the issue that your uh, uh, the, the delegate asked the question, this lack of sensitivity, I think sometimes that's our role as VI professionals to try and add in that that nuance where available. Yeah, thank you. Just mildly attached to that, we've had a question about flagship eye hospitals and the possibility of them having some employed specialist psychologists in the in the VI sector. Do you have any information or hope that that might happen or is it happening? Um, anything at all in that arena? I'm, I'm afraid uh, I probably have no more information on that than, than the majority of delegates. W what I would hope is that the expectation and the, the the anticipation around that would be would be fulfilled that that in flagship eye hospitals there would be uh, a role for specialist clinical psychologists to be involved uh mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a glaring omission i mean uh having worked in hospitals uh in a, in a kind of broadly mental health uh, health psychology environment for many years now 15 years plus uh, i've seen psychologists become comp key component parts and children and adult services of a great number of different uh, areas and you know, oncology and pain and rheumatology and diabetes. And the lack of psychological input in um, sight loss and in, in VI is as is, is striking as is, is, is unacceptable. So I, I, along with whatever delegate asked that question, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that uh, this is an opportunity for greater integration of clinical psychology and, and sight loss. That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? It would. Uh, um, so, a um, brand new sort of angle, can you say anything specific about fatigue linked to uh, psychological and emotional adjustment and or as an effort of living with a visual impairment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's, it's a big issue, right? Just fatigue, exhaustion. I mean, for, for some people, it may, be, it may be a component part of a broader uh, kind of health diagnosis, but for pretty much everybody that is adjusting to a significant life-changing condition, mm. the toll that that takes on them will, of course, be kind of will be ex will be exhausting by definition. Living with stress, living with anxiety, living with in some cases trauma, is exhausting. This is just your your body being required by the psychological impact of what you're experiencing to work harder. And mm. and working harder, you're holding all that tension and that that stress in your body, and of course, it is exhausting. Now, that in of itself is a problem. You know, the, the exhaustion can have a significant impact on someone's functioning, psychological and physical. Of course, the exhaustion also has an impact in terms of that person's engagement in both day-to-day -day life, and that engagement is key to keeping someone's psychological well-being kind of optimal. It also is going to have a big impact on that person's engagement with the health professionals that are around and whatever programs or processes are being put in place to try and uh, improve their kind of functioning or, or to try and uh, help them to acquire new skills. It's difficult. The, the level of that fatigue will vary person to person and there's a, there's, a, there's a decision to be made for each individual and by each individual, I think, about when to push a bit harder, mm -hmm. when to engage in a bit more self-care and pull back a bit. 
both ends of that continuum are potentially unhealthy. Being too self-protecting and just withdrawing entirely as a means to try and prevent too much uh, exhaustion is probably going to lead to disengagement from the activities that the person could conceivably be doing. But of course, at the other end of the scale, doing too much while tired is going to lead to burnout. So what I would encourage people to do, and what I, I do encourage people to do, is, is to try and take up a, a kind of, uh, this is an educational term, but kind of zone of proximal development. Think about just where you need to be and push a little bit further, potentially, while monitoring for signs of burnout. And if it feels like you're pushing a bit too harder, mm. pull back a bit, but to avoid the spending days in bed thing. Spending days upon day in bed, unless under the direction of a doctor, from a psychology perspective, is often pretty disastrous because it means not doing things, not having a sense of achievement, not socializing with other people. So managing that exhaustion can be a, a really kind of key aspect of psychological well-being and it is about finding that balance more often yeah. than not. Thank you. So um, a question, the odd position of answering my own questions. Um, just got a couple for Retina UK. Um, we've had um, a question about um, having lived experience uh, so we're lucky enough to have delegates today that support our community that have lived experience and how you can help Retina UK and support other people. Um, if you have a look on the website or, or ring our office, there's lots and lots of volunteering, talk and support, helpline opportunities for anybody who would like to get more involved, either from professional or if you've got personal lived experience, we, we welcome all of those inquiries. And we've also been asked if we would consider having trained and accredited counsellors um, on top of our other support resources. Um, and we are exploring that role within the charity and, and what role we as a charity play within supporting those services. Um, as part of that, um, and with the guidance and input from our volunteer helpliners, we have created a suite of resources um, to help them with their own mental health and wellbeing. And we are looking to roll this out throughout our community as well as other support services. So please do watch this space um, and keep in touch with the Retina UK website and team um, and you'll see when those support services will um, arise. So, and then back, swiftly back as if I'm a different person again. And um, just very quickly, because we've only got um, two minutes left, I've just got one more question that we can squeeze in. Um, and that is, um, Ian, have you been able to provide any online support? Um, and this question is to children and young people specifically, but I think probably for anybody that have not been able to access hospitals during the pandemic. And is this something that if you have been doing, would you continue to do or would you consider? Yeah, so so we, we absolutely did. One thing that uh, here in uh, Oxford we did quite uh, quickly, I think, is move to online video conferencing platforms. So there's yeah. one that NHS uses called Attend Anywhere. It's a bit like Zoom, but because it's the NHS, it works much less well, but it's probably more secure. So we've used that. It's been great. You know, we have a wide patch. I mean, most eye hospitals, I guess, need to. You know, they, they work across a wide area, and that's been a huge obstacle to many children and you know older people accessing psychological support. So having these technologies has been brilliant. What, what, what I would say is, Again, they have a bit of a differential impact. You know, if people have good technology and good internet, great. Unfortunately, people who are least likely to have good technology and good internet may be people with you know, less kind of financial resources to kind of utilize. And actually they end up being somewhat disadvantaged by the process, which is tricky and something that I guess we need to bear in mind when using it as a core part of our business. Uh, yeah. I think there's no doubt we're gonna keep using this sort of technology to reach people. And in fact, try to think ways in which we could reach kind of even more broadly. Or holding in mind the idea that it's probably not accessible for all and there are some people with kind of different presentations that find sensory issues associated with using this technology somewhat overwhelming or difficult to use so we're going to keep using it but we're going to have to think a little carefully about precisely how yes and that's that's certainly something that, that that we would echo i think everyone went up the very steep zoom learn curve um and it's how we we maintain that Thank you so much, Ian, for being here today. We really, really appreciate it. Your input has been absolutely incredibly useful. Um, and um, I know that the delegates and the team got a massive amount of both your presentation and your question and answer session. So thank you ever so much. And uh, I think we're on to the next session. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers, Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. The Ocustim therapy for transcorneal electrical stimulation is the only topically applied treatment for retinitis pigmentosa of clinically demonstrated safety and efficacy. It is suitable for the treatment 
of retinitis pigmentosa, Usher syndrome, Conan rod dystrophy, and choroideremia. Its purpose is to preserve vision by slowing down the progression of RP. While the normal course of RP would mean a gradual loss of visual field, leading to tunnel vision and sometimes complete blindness, this would be slowed down or even halted during regular therapy. Natural progression has been shown to return after terminating the therapy. The Ocustim therapy works by activating the body's self-preservation mechanisms. A weak electric current is applied to the surface of the eye with a very fine electrode thread. This activates neuroprotective processes in the retina that help slow down the retinal degeneration. Over 300 patients have participated in clinical trials to date and used the therapy for a combined 130 years without any serious adverse event related to the device or therapy. The studies have shown significant effects on photoreceptor function, visual field and visual acuity, as well as retinal oxygen metabolism. The Ocustim therapy is available in the UK now. Visit our website for contact details and further information on evidence. www.ocuvision.de/en. Thank you very much.